Is it every man's battle? Well, no, there was a guy up in Idaho who never really struggled with it. But other than him, you know, it's just pretty much everyone's battle. And we all deal with this and we all have to make a decision about lust and sexual integrity. One of the things that worked so well for guys was to think about, what are you doing feeding this thing? You know, uh, is masturbation giving you relief or is it actually throwing gasoline on the fire? And uh, why don't you try starving your eyes of sexually enticing and explicit images and see what that does to your quote unquote uncontrollable, amazingly powerful sex drive. And in the book it says, you know, starve the sumo because you can get so much of this, you end up with a sumo wrestler size sex drive that is out of control. And so guys did it and they found it really did. It was kind of a reboot key. But then the other thing was just this simple thing of bouncing the eyes and not feeling like you were entitled to look at whatever was available for you to look at. And so it gave guys some things to talk about and some things to do to where they started to experience some victory. And uh, I don't know, you know, how God allowed me to be part of all that, but I am just so grateful that I got to be part of that because, you know, this is funny. I mean, it's not funny, it's serious, but I go places, women come up to me and they're in tears, uh, thanking me for giving them their husband back and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just bizarre to see how much of an impact it can have on a couple when he decides, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go live the life that I haven't been able to live up till now, but I'm gonna do whatever it takes. So I think we've got to look at physiologically, what are we doing uh, to, you know, kind of help our mood stay stable and not get too uh, much into craving things that do satisfy us physically. In other words, if you're out there eating junk and, and your blood sugar's up and down, that's gonna affect your desire and craving and lust. So you gotta look at that, it's important. And then as far as the, um, the mind goes, um, you know, I think that's where these little things like bouncing the eyes come in, is using your, your mind and, and uh, also thinking about taking captive anything that would come up. But if you look at uh, Romans 12, 2, it says, uh, like the message I think reads more accurately than most where it says, you know, be transformed by changing the way you think. It's really important because it's not changing the things you think about. And for somebody to just say, I'm gonna try real hard not to think about any of that and, and uh, you know, those pictures, those magazines, and then, well, you're gonna think about it if that's what you're doing. But when you start to change the way you think, for instance, when you start to think, this is not a person in this picture who's making millions of dollars showing me her body. This is a desperate, woman. Uh, inside is a hurting person who has probably been through a very, very horrific childhood. That is someone's daughter. That's someone's sister. That is a creation of God. I bet there is creativity in her. I bet there are things that she could do, but she's trapped into this world of pornography. And me having bought this or looking at this, I'm part of that industry now. And I, you know, I would do anything to save someone's daughter and she's God's daughter. And, and so you start to think differently about a female so that you're not always uh, approaching women at chest level, you know, and uh, you're looking at their eyes and seeing them as real human beings. And then, of course, the soul uh, and what we do there to replenish the soul and nurture and, uh, and nourish the soul. That's done in connection with other people. And it's, it's done in a way that encourages us and, and uh, builds us up. It also is done in a way that confronts us or questions us. Uh, you, I just don't think you can take care of your soul if you're gonna be isolated and not connecting with other people. And in, especially in this instance where there's so much shame, uh, the way to break out of that shame is to talk to somebody, to share with somebody. And, and then once you do, you, you open yourself up to something other than just controlling my problem or being on top of my problem to a whole different way 
of life. And I've heard people say they were so glad they got hooked on pornography because it was the thing that led them to this different life of responsibility, recovery, character development, and connection with other people. If you've been isolated in your sexual addiction or your lust obsession that you set out as, my job is to find somebody that I can literally share everything uh, about my life. And so that might take me a year or two years, but I'm gonna do it, that's gonna be my job. Outside of work, my new job, find the person I can connect with. And then, you know, that's gold, and then you find somebody else, and pretty soon you've got a small group of three or four people. But if that isn't for some reason possible, find the ways that technology can connect you with other people around this issue. I mean, I, I think uh, there has never been a time when there are more opportunities to find men who would like to share, connect, some way encourage in the area of sexual integrity on the internet in many, many different forms. I think uh, the big insight that we need for unmarried guys, especially, is, well, women too, the bifurcation myth that you can live this way, and then you eat some wedding cake, and then everything's different. You're, you're, you're not gonna have any of these desires, or any, it's just gonna change. The cake's gonna change it all. And I think that fuels the addiction even more because your expectation is so high, your shame is greater on the other side of that. And uh, I, I think you know, the beginning of solving the problem is dealing with premarrieds and this issue. I mean, it, there should never be a premarital counseling session held by a credible counselor that the question about lust, pornography, emotional affairs, uh, sexual history, uh, all of those things aren't dealt with. Because if they're not, you're just asking for trouble uh, later when the person finally has to say, okay, this is what I was struggling with and I never told you about it. You know, I've uh, had a very promiscuous past and um, you know, when I was single, I had an affair uh, very early on with a married woman. I mean, you know, just horrific things. I um, was promiscuous, got a girl pregnant, paid for an abortion, all of those things. And I've written about all of them. Now, if you have shame, there are really only two reasons. One is you haven't fully surrendered uh, the sin to God and accepted his forgiveness. Or you know, you're still involved in a, a behavior that it's good that you feel shame. You're, you're getting a signal there that you need to step up your program of, of recovery or spiritual renewal or growth. You need to do more so that that isn't in your life. But one of the things that, that I think needs to be said also in this area is that you, you should not be shamed or shame yourself when you're tempted. Temptation is not the same as sin. Now, uh, someone that doesn't really understand this m might want to put that on you. But it just, it isn't. And we're all going to be tempted. And the question is, what do you do with that temptation? Sometimes you're going to deal with it perfectly. Sometimes uh, you may stagger a half a second or so. But it's important that you not shame yourself needlessly when you're tempted with so much temptation uh, that is out there. But God does not intend us to live with shame. I don't know of any coach that before the team goes out to play ball says to them, okay, guys, we got to get out there and don't forget how horrible we looked last week, how we embarrassed our families and, and really disgraced this school. Get out there, think about that, focus on it, feel that shame, and let's win this game. You would just never do that. And I don't think God does that with either. I think God, when the Bible says, wipes the slate clean, I, I believe that. It says white as snow. I believe white as snow. Not a dull gray, but white as snow. And I think that's what God calls us to, is to live free and beyond that shame, but to be open and honest. And people say, what do I tell my child? I just say, don't lie. You know, when they start to ask questions, don't lie. And then take a minute to think about, what if I did share? Would this connect me to these kids in a different way? And would it kind of release me from some of the shame of secrecy that I have even within my own family? Well, you know, all of this began with a, a principle, a, a foundation of truth that came 
from Scripture. And it really didn't start in the New Testament, it started in the Old Testament with uh, looking at the life of Job and um, him making this commitment that he was not going to look to the, um, the left or the right, but he was going to continue to look forward. And what a great challenge that is uh, to not let there even be a hint of sexual immorality in our lives. These are things, these are time-tested principles uh, of sexual integrity. And, and you go back and you look at the life of David, and he is just a great example of more than enough is never enough when you're alone as a man and you, you simply have no accountability. And I love the passage where it says, uh, and in the spring when all of the kings went off to war, David stayed back at home. And uh, I think that's where he lost his, uh, his ability to withstand the temptation. He wasn't connected and he wasn't doing the job that he usually did. So I like to, um, I like to talk about that, uh, about this not having any hint uh, looking at the Old Testament, at the principles that are there for sexual integrity. But when you go over to the New Testament, you know, when you hear Jesus say things like, you know, you've heard it said, like you've heard it said uh, not to commit adultery. Boy, it's just here, even 2,000 years later, uh, you see people standing up on an altar committing that their body will never, ever have sex with another person. But they don't commit anything else in that marriage except their body. And here Jesus was addressing that. Hey, you've heard it said about this adultery thing, but I say, you know, if you're even looking on a woman with lust, hey, you know, we're talking about the same thing. And it's just too bad that we haven't changed marriage vows to include that biblical principle that, that Christ was calling us to. It's not just what your body does, but it's what you're doing in your mind. Truly, the, the temptation does uh, come from within and you fall from within. And so we have to make an additional commitment. And, and then I, I think one of the, uh, the greatest passages uh, of Scripture that means a lot to me is John 8, 31, 32. Many people know that passage from one little phrase, the truth will set you free. And uh, I think it's probably the most uh, misquoted passage in Scripture. It's like a battle cry. But if you look at that passage, it says, If you follow my teachings, you are truly my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, if you want to know the truth about your sexuality and your life, your virility, then follow Christ. Uh, treat women the way he did, honor them the way he did, and live that life of integrity and, and live as his disciple. And, and then you're going to know the truth about yourself and that truth will lead you to freedom. You're also going to know the biblical truth that represents God. We don't, we don't just do holy things because they're nice and clean. We do holy things because God is holy. We, we don't just have a principle of authenticity and truth with other people and our spouse. We do it because God is truth. And God's truth is what we search for and long for or uh, hopefully reach a point in our life where that's what we're searching for. And when we live that truth, um, no regrets whatsoever. So I encourage people, you know, in, the, in fact, in all of our books, we, we list these scriptures that we hope will influence them. But, you know, the other thing is, if you don't believe the Bible is true, then Scripture doesn't really do you much good. But if you will look at the consequences of lust, obsession, sexual addiction, and unfaithfulness in many forms, if you look at the consequences versus the result of a, a man and a woman truly committed to each other, wanting to find deeper levels of authentic intimacy together, one is the, the cheap substitute and the other is the, the real thing. Um, Dave Stoop, a guy I work with, we were in Canada and we were fascinated at so many people going to this wax museum up there. And I asked the question, why do we even have wax museums? So 
uh, went back home and did a little study of what is the phenomena of the wax museum. And they say, well, for some reason, human beings, if you can't experience the real thing, if you can't be in Marilyn Monroe's bedroom, you find some satisfaction in being in the perfect replica of her bedroom. Or if you can't be near uh, Elvis Presley, because he's dead, uh, then getting near an exact replica gives you some satisfaction. And a lot of guys are out there and they are participating in the exact replica, the perfect, I mean almost, almost perfect uh, substitute for the real thing. And it gives them some satisfaction. But in living in that mildly satisfying, always deteriorating world, they never ever get to experience the real thing. And that's a sad thing for a guy who thinks he's so sexual, so driven by his sex drive, to have never really experienced all that God called sex to be. I think that's a really sad place to be. And it's worth giving up what you have thought about sexuality and, and start to look at it from a different perspective. I like to challenge guys to ask them this question. What if you had it all wrong? Just think about it. What if you had it all wrong? And you really did need to totally change the way you look at your life, the life of other people, and the sexual being that you are. Uh, if you're willing to do that, I think the whole world can open up to you a world where you'll be free of sexual addiction.